let's all sing together. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my being's ransom powers, all my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my hours. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my days and all my hours. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my days and all my hours. Let my hands perform His bidding, let my feet run in His ways. Let my eyes see Jesus only, let my lips speak for His praise. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, let my leaps spit for his praise. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, let my lips speak forth his praise. Three for the last. Since my eyes were fixed on Jesus, I've lost sight of all beside. So enchained my spirit's vision, looking at the crucified. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, looking at the crucified. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, looking at the crucified. First Samuel chapter one. Well, thank you, folks, for a few folks to stay with us for same as Wednesday night. I'm glad there's a few folks I can look at. A few folks like I'm actually teaching somebody, and then it, I know it gets broadcast out. Did you read in the bulletin that only in America can a pizza get to your house faster than an ambulance? That is really something, because only in America do we leave cars worth thousands of dollars in the driveway and leave useless junk in boxes in the garage. It is something. Um, it's been, I'm thinking six years ago that we heard evangelist John Getch, who was one of the vice uh, presidents of West Coast Bible College, and they had written down at the Wilds 2018. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit within you. Be teachable from those around you. Be prayerful about the things that overwhelm you. Be communicative to those depending on you. Be flexible to situations that come at you. Be faithful to tasks given to you. Be mindful of the flesh still in you. Be forgetful of the hurts fired at you. Be committed to the God who has called you. Be expectant of the victories God has promised you. Be humble about the results God gives you. These things you wouldn't remember, except you write them down. You write them in your Bibles or something when you're at camp and keep, keep them before you. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 24. One word, word dedication. And when she had weaned him... She took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour, it's like a basket, and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord, for this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth, and he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. 
I believe that's an entirely different subject, and I've tried to find out how the use of the word lent is in this passage in the original languages. That's really a mysterious use here, that God granted and gave Hannah a child, and then she, and we'd think in terms, as loaned him back to serve the Lord. But at least on this subject here this, this afternoon, be very brief, and... Um, keep you just for a few minutes hopefully on this word dedication what's taking place here let's have a short word of prayer together you pray as I pray and ask the Lord bless in these few minutes Holy Father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name we think of the word dedication and those who best best displayed it and best lived it and dear Father may uh, we be challenged by that in Christ's name amen there's no way that you could have a ministry like uh, likened to the the wild Christian camp ministry unless in its history there has been some very, very dedicated people. In the first years of the camp in 1969, those, those roads, even for miles back from the camp, were dirt, single lane, in some places gravel roads. The first time that I attended, I drove a bus for 10 miles up, those, up that gravel road. And then when you found this little white sign entrance, you drove another dirt road back to what is considered the lodge now. And the entire camp was that. Uh, there was an outdoor basketball court uh, in the parking lot, and there was that, there was that building. On down by the boys' cabin is a little A-frame. They called it a birdhouse. Really comfortably, it could sleep four, maybe. And that would be tight. And as the camp grew, they started sleeping eight kids per each of those birdhouses. Uh, to, to, uh, the water slide went down the hill and, and threw you up in the air, and we landed in the creek. They had a deep spot in the creek, and we landed in the creek. Um, the activities were hiking and uh, playing in the creek. And then the lakefront was developed, and they showed all the big things that the lakefront would be and swimming at what was the shoreline there. But I just know, um, of all things, one of the founders, uh, they had, it was always Army-Navy week, or as far as the teams, Army-Navy. Uh, one of the founders was Rock Royer. He ended up being a football coach when Liberty University was started, their first football coach. He had on his plane, on the tail of his plane, you must be born again. And he'd come down and he'd be representative of the Navy team, I believe. Rock Royer ended up being our youth director's uh, coach at Liberty University. He was killed in that plane, that plane crash, and he was killed in that plane crash in those first years of the camp. It, oh, it was a tragedy. It was just awful, this, you know. But I'm telling you, Brother Hay and several others, they were extremely dedicated to live in those little birdhouses year-round and keep clearing land. What a vision. Keep clearing land and one thing after another, keep adding to the camp to what you see today, and what we see today. And I know that's abbreviative. You can buy the book, the 50th year anniversary, and you, if you read it and see how the campers slept or how the workers lived and what little they lived on, you would not even hardly believe that it is what it is today, except someone was dedicated. Someone had a vision, had a burden, and they stayed and stuck with it. This passage, I'm, I'm using this, but we read the, big, the beginning of 1 Samuel and how it starts, I believe, is the emphasis on this. Samuel, the book before this is Judges, or, you know, Ruth and which lived in the time of the judges. It was the time of the judges, almost 400 years, a little bit over that. Samuel himself would be a priest and a judge, which would usually be one. A spiritual leader would also be the civic leader. You talk about the true power of, of, of leadership in the United States. It's the Supreme Court. There can be executive actions. There can be laws passed by Congress and signed by the president. But if someone challenged that law and said, I don't know if this matches the Constitution, there's a Supreme Court justice that can say yes or no. 
whether that passes or not. That's in a simple sense the power of a judge. The people for nearly 400 years would find this wise person. And remember, Deborah would be one for a while. And Samson would be one for a while. And Ehud and others. People brought their cases to that person. Said, here's our problem. Or here's, our, here's an action. Or here's a, a dispute. And that judge solved that. And gave his answer. And he would try and, or his job was to know the law of God to settle those disputes. Or if it, even if it had to be with... Uh, the next books after first, when First Samuel comes along will be the introduction of the kings. Samuel introduces and Samuel anoints the first king of Israel. So he's the last of the judges. He introduces the first king of Israel. This is the biggest transition, you might say, in the history of Israel that takes place. Going from a theocracy governed by God's word as a constitution and a judge determining it to in the basic life of the people to a king. This shows us the importance of who Samuel is. It's been said that there's probably two characters in the Old Testament that nothing negative is said about them, one being Joseph, and if you suppose something negative is that he shared his dreams with his brothers. I don't think that's wrong. He was a dreamer. So can't suppose that upon him, but not negative about his life. Then possibly Daniel. Don't see read anything about Daniel except some suppose upon that he wasn't one of the three that stood at the fire image or the image, but most likely maybe wasn't there. But as far as the scripture is saying anything negative about him, you won't say, but, like David and Bathsheba, but Noah and he planted a vineyard and got drunk, but Abraham went down to Egypt, but, you know, Samuel. You come along him, and if you want to suppose anything negative about him, and it is a tragic statement, his sons didn't serve the Lord. Their sons didn't follow in his ways. But all we read about Samuel is that he was a mighty judge and he's a, a mighty priest to anoint the next uh, king, the first king of Israel. The beginning of his life was focused on his mother. These chapters here, chapter 1, chapter 2 was first Samuel. Um, we realize she's a second wife. She's a second wife of Elkanah. Um, she has no children, can't have children. At least up to this point, not able to have children. And his, his first wife has plenty of children. And so much it says that she becomes Hannah's adversary. She um, has a spirit to um, provoke Hannah. And I know the importance in the Old Testament economy of having children. And you think that's foreign to the Old Testament. It's not. In pioneer days of the United States, having children was of utmost importance. Pioneers, oh boy, they, they pushed. If they could, they married. And if, one, if the missus died young, they married again. If that one died, they married again. Why, they, the rule was, you know, one acre of land and, Lord willing, eight children and make a living. That's, that was just kind of a... Something a part of our American history, the importance of being married, the importance of having a child. But it was ingrained mostly into the hearts of the Hebrew women. The first words of God's husband and wife, go forth, fill the earth, and then with the fall of man, there is going to be a descendant of the woman who will bring victory over Satan. Genesis 3, chapter 15. It was ingrained in Hebrew women right up until the time of Mary, Elizabeth. The importance of a woman to have a son, and Lord willing, that son to be a Messiah. The Messiah. Boy, is that a brief rundown in these few minutes. It is ingrained in Hannah to have a child, but she can't. It's the provocation of the first wife of Elkanah, who has children, to be an adversary to her. I'm used, you're not. I'm special, you're not, et cetera, et cetera. And you saw that between Leah and Rachel too, right? You know, so she's brokenhearted. These verses I do want to read. Verse 8, 
cha uh, chapter 1, verse 8. Then said Elkanah his husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? Now, ten sons would be something, wouldn't it? But watch what, is it? Watch what her husband says. Am I not important? Than, than, am I not special to you more than ten sons? And he gave her double portions. The other wife had, had kids, but to Hannah, he gave double portions. He was good to her. But we see that he sees she's grieved and her heart's broken. Look at verse 10. And, it was, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. We think of the being sore amazed, being much amazed. And I know it's used similar as I read in Bible study. For those that know the languages, they'll say long-suffering is more than just patience. It's patience with endurance. It's enduring the trouble that comes along with the situation. It's suffering, and it's long-suffering. And so we see the word sore, it has to do when they were sore grieved, and they were sore amazed. There's some pain to it. Maybe it's mental affliction. Maybe it's physical affliction. Well, she's praying, and she hurts as she prays. Well, I don't know, I ever prayed like that and hurt where they prayed. And then verse 15. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit, and I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. And there she is before Eli, and he takes note of her mouth as it moves. He takes note of how she looks. And this is not feigned. I was thinking in the prayer at time this morning, this is no broad phylactery. This is not making broad stripes at the hem of a garden. garden. Sometimes, like the Pharisees, they wanted to be seen for their faces that they look like they're fasting because there's a way that someone fasting might look, maybe a little paler in color, maybe a little more, maybe a little more solid in spirit because there's a way someone looks who's not eaten for three days. There's a way someone uh, walks and their energy level that has not eaten for several days. Well, there's no faking to this. She looked to the priest. She looked like she had been drinking. Her mouth movement, her maybe the movement of her head, the actions of her body. And he thinks he's got a drunk woman at the altar. Now, I just use that to say this. No, nope, that's how heartbroken she is. That's how much it's been affected her spirit and how it's affected her spiritually. She so wants that son. Or that child. Husband take note of it. Others take note of it. High priest takes note of it. And it's noted to be very genuine. Chapter 1 verse 27. For this child I prayed. And the Lord hath given me my petition. Which I asked of him. And we realize that not only is she a broken hearted woman. She's a beloved wife. She's bothered by her adversary. And she, and, but she's barren. And here we find that she's blessed. I just ran through my little outline there. Now she's blessed. And I can't imagine what it was like when she gave birth to that son and she held him for the first time. But she'd also made a promise. And she also was determined to do something. Chapter 2, verse 1, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted. And that's like, talk about tooting your own horn. This might be some root to that. This is where, you know, before her adversary and before others and to her husband. But mostly it has when we see the horns that are on the beast and stuff like that. It's like their crowning achievement and their coronation, their empire, their kingdom. Watch what she's saying here. You can sound the horn. My, my little empire is, is started. Um, I'm going to keep reading it. Exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. Her thanks and gift. Now watch what she said. Having that son, my salvation. She understands the importance of Samuel. She knows that this deliverance is just is to her. This deliverance will also be to the house of Israel. The last judge, the first the first anointing of a king in this transition time comes with this little son that she takes to the temple. 
Some say three, some say five, some say seven, some say it's the age of a bar mitzvah, as is traditionally known to, we, we always actually think maybe real young, but maybe it's at the 12, age of 12, when he can actually serve and be a help to the high priest. So I'm kind of going to hold with that. And since that became a traditional, traditional culture of Israel, that this is now my son's able to get his inheritance and able to begin his apprenticeship to the fathers. So all that took place when they would come that age uh, for the girl and for the boy. So I'm going to say, here's a young man that she leaves at the temple, and she'd bring him a coat year by year, birthday present. How's my boy doing? Serving in the house of the Lord, young girl. Dedication. There's so many things that people give their life to. I mean, give their life to. I built upon that like the camp. Somebody had to give their life to that and for that. And usually, if I read it right and correctly, um, in just a general sense of a American culture, people give themselves to money. Money, m money, making money. Uh, money represents being able to do things. It used to be in an old Frank and Ernest cartoon where they're sitting there looking at him and it says, he said, and he's reminding Frank, he said, Frank, you know money, you, uh, you can't take it with you when you go. And Ernest looks back at him, he said, yeah, yeah but you can't go anywhere without it. <laughs> you know, you got to have it. So people give their life to it, but the degree they give their life to it is something. Some knowing it's a, you, you got to have mammon. You got to eat and to live. You got to have it. But some folks give their entire life to having more of it and what it can, and the power it gives to them. Some pursue and are very dedicated to fame. They want to make themselves known. I think two and three were, in the surveys, were switched back and forth, fame and fun and uh, or pleasure, but be that may, two and three were those two. They've got to be known. I've got to be, it's got to be the Oscar. It's got to be the championship trophy. It's got to be, uh, you know, a pro level. It's got to be, so some give themselves to the recognition of the fame, where maybe even politics. The other one closely related with two and three, money was first. Pleasure. Some people are dedicated to pleasure. <laughs> Just got to have fun. When I think of that, some people are dedicated, dedicated to hunting. Some people are dedicated. I mean, it's their life to fish. It's their life to golf. Because two days a week, three days a week, four days a week, you know, I've just that's my whole life. They're dedicated to it. We don't, may not relate to that, but some people do. Uh, I, I go back to that young school teacher and uh, bringing in the young man in my office that you know, I said, got it, four counseling services, four or six, you know, if they want to get married in the church. And, and by the way, just just to that note, Brother Skelly and I were talking about different things in ministry. And one thing he said, you can't see many young people get married anymore. I said, well, we don't have many, that many really, but uh, no, we don't have a lot of weddings in the church. He said, well, we're, we're noticing that too. Not, not very many young people get married, not very many get married in churches. Now, that's something, that's just preacher talk, so like that. But that young man was sitting there, and he told me that he was on a Concord basketball basketball league on Sundays. He was on a bowling league on Thursday nights. He was in a church softball league on two nights a week, and he was in a church basketball league on the other night. So I looked at her and said, do you want to marry him or his sports? I asked him, I said, are you willing to give some of this up, spend some time with her? Oh, sure, yeah, I am. He never did. And two years later, she said, I just married someone that was more dedicated to sports than me. Some people are dedicated to their having fun, want to play. I just use an illustration, but a true one, true illustration. And then there are some that are, that are dedicated to a person or their family. That was number four. They're dedicated, man, that fam everything else can go aside. It's my family. Or everything goes aside, it could be like, Elkanah would say, am I, not more spe am I not more special to you than ten sons? And I just, I just use that uh, my way of teaching sometimes, even counsel young people. Maybe someday the Lord will bless your family with children, but don't forget this. Don't forget this. 
Those children will be wonderful. Those children will be special. Those children will be the most beautiful thing in the world. But your spouse is still number one. Please don't forget that. <laughs> then ten children. The spouse is still number one. Dedication. Think of those things of the world sense. I, th I think of the, the call that Christ gave in Luke 19. If any man will follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Another subject of the whole message is the, the, the burden of the cross and willingness to take it up. But I see that as special as this child was, and Hannah realizing this and all that led up to it, she took him down to the temple. Well, this would be, this would be the place of worship and tabernacle and where Eli had served. And she says, I'm giving him to the Lord. And how, how it touches my heart to think through the years that he, the parents who allowed their children, allowed their children, wanted their children, and dedicated their children to be missionaries. You know how hard that must have been. Missionaries talk to me today about the convenience and how blessed it is. Brother Skelly has his youngest daughter, very special, close to their family, Hannah. She's in Australia. But how hard it is for her to be in Australia. And, you know, it's, you know, so, but man, they got Facebook or they got, they can Skype to each other and they can get in and talk to each other and see each other. And uh, they can do travel and get down there. Well, Wanda's down there right now. Going to spend a month or better down there. Well, nearly three months and spend it as Hannah. They had their first child so she can be there. And then they'll come home. But that's still hard. But missionaries in old days, man, they went and got on a boat in a harbor in New York. And whatever family member brought them there, if they were there, they waved at them. They headed off to Africa or somewhere, not knowing they'd ever see them again. Whoa. And the greatest missionary endeavors of this world were when people were that dedicated and did that. Most of us are familiar to be from this be to be are familiar with Jim Elliott, 1927-1956. He's a graduate of Wheaton College when it was a conservative Christian college. It has long since departed from that, the increments of his part. Billy Graham actually was in, in, instrumental with being part of that in its early years of evangelism. That's where Jim Elliott, Peter Fleming, those are the names two most familiar. Uh, they joined three other friends, Ed McCauley, McCauley Roger Yordarian, and Nate Saint, those are the easier names, Elliot and Saint. And they had a burden to reach the Yucca people, Aka people, A-U-C-A. They go by a different name today, the Huronians, or something like that. Anyways, on Sunday afternoon, January 8, 1956, but like just eight months on the mission field to reach these people, they had flown their plane, uh, Nate Saint, and, and, and dropped out gifts and things over this primitive uh, Indian tribe of the jungles. So they had hoped after doing that for several uh, weeks, dropping gifts, food supplies, that when they, when they would set up camp that the, they could meet the people on friendly terms. But on that Sunday afternoon, those five men landed and were setting up camp, and the Indians came out of the jungle with spears and hatchets and murdered all five. The story doesn't end there. Of course, you've known if you've read the book, and the skies of splendor and things like that. But you've, well, anyways. Um, two years later, Rachel Saint, Nate's sister, and Elizabeth Elliot, um, Jim's wife, went back to that same tribe with nothing. The two women walked into that village not knowing what would happen. And because they were women or because the angel of the Lord who will ever say, they began to fix meals and feed the children. And the suspicious men would watch and the suspicious, suspicious women would watch. Within two years, they'd led 30 to Christ. In the five years, that whole village would come to know Jesus. And they ministered and started a church with the same men who had murdered their husband and brother. 
What do you call something like that? Dedication. Dedication to the reaching the gospel, taking the gospel and loving people. Young folks heard a good portion of the service on Friday night. I saw Brother Skelly had gone to the testimony of William Borden. When he, start, when he said, William, <laughs> well, lo and behold, we probably both had just read the same biography just published by Brother Rasmussen at West Coast Bible College about taking the gospel of the lost and, and William Borden. So I leaned over to him and said, that's, gonna be, that's William Borden. Yeah, he, was, he graduated from high school at 16 years of age with outstanding grades and things and the tutorship of his mother and so like that. But yes, the Borden, the Borden family, not just technology and metals. So you probably think of them as dairy, Borden milk. And they, they, were, they were millionaires in, at the turn of the 1800s to 1900s. So what would that be today? Um, and he's the heir. So he did enroll in Yale. And I'll tell you, I can tell you something similar to this, and I'll wrap this up real quick. I can tell you something similar to this. He entered at Yale University, which had a Christian motto of reaching the lost for Christ. So it still was some semblance of a Christian college then. But even then was so many not serving the Lord already and so many pursuing other things in laws or like that. He started a Bible cl uh, club. It had 150 in it in his freshman year. In his senior year, there was 1,300 students at Yale University. 1,000 of them were meeting with William Borden in his Bible study clubs. He transferred on over to Princeton University, and he was one of the first to sign, of all things, Princeton, another Christian college, to sign the Princeton Pledge. The Princeton Pledge said this, We declare ourselves willing and desires, God permitting, to go to the unevangelized portions of the world. That was the Princeton University Pledge, still at that time, predominantly Christian school. And he is one of the first to sign the pledge to go to the, uns to the unheard of the gospel. He did get to go at his graduation. His father did allow him to uh, take a w one year and to travel the world. That's when he chose that he would go and reach the Muslim population that would be from the border of India to South China. He moved to Cairo, Egypt to study Arabic in the school there. He was there two and a half months, contracted spinal meningitis. His mother come to visit him. He passed away in her presence. That's not the end of the story. That's what we heard, what he was willing to do, but he didn't get there. Everywhere he went, but it's his mother who took his Bible and opened his Bible that he'd gone through Yale and Princeton with and found that he'd written in the front of his Bible, no reserves, no retreat, no regrets. That famous statement would be the inspiration for the next years for the China Inland Mission and for other mission institutes to see over 1,000 young people volunteer their lives to go to the mission field. He was willing to give it all. Not even get to even see much of it going. I think of that. Um, I had a cousin who went to Ohio State University. My cousin professed to know Christ as a Savior, grew up in a kind of a, a, bio, a church that preached the gospel, but it had become fairly liberal. They were never very much active in it except to attend. So, but my cousin went to Ohio State University. But someone there, someone there started a little prayer and Bible club and invited my cousin, and he dedicated his life to the Lord. And then by the time he was a senior, before he'd gone to advanced med uh, working with animals. <laughs> I was going to say vegetarian. <laughs> veterinarian. Before he'd gone, graduated be a veterinarian. Uh, all through the campus of Ohio State University, he was leading, he was leading this massive movement of, of people studying the Bible, coming to Christ. I, I go, really? My, how'd that happen? Dedication. I just tell you, he got dedicated. He got serious and ended up affecting a campus of that size. So I know it can happen. I use these names, whether it's Jim Elliott, whether it's William Borden, whether it's others. 
where there's where well, see what Hannah here realizing this massive transition I've I've given my son to the Lord to serve the Lord may we be more dedicated to take up the cross and follow him to, first of all be dedicated to Jesus Christ Jesus second to the family of God and third to the ministry of reaching the lost and of course right in there whether it be number two or three or four dedicated to seeing our families serve the Lord ministries like the wilds ministry like the China Inland Mission, Mission ministries like whether it's on college campus or like that is because somebody somebody gets dedicated that's how it happens let's close in prayer kept you longer than I thought it would thank you I appreciate it Holy Father bless help this this single word an example of a few of your choice servants stick in our hearts dear father bless you bless in Christ's name Amen.